The experience of being an adhd -er influences people throughout their lifetime. Whether it's understanding the experience of children to reconciling a diagnosis as an adult, we know that the needs of adhd -ers don't go away, they just change. This Perspectives episode brings the insights from three of our guests together. A quick note, we're going to be opening up the registration for the Neurodiversity University Educator Hub in January. So if you're a teacher and you missed registering when we opened it last time, keep an eye out for that to open soon. If you want to make sure that you don't miss it, we have a link in the show notes for you to sign up for notifications for when it opens. Our first segment today features Dr. Sharon Celine. Sharon is a psychologist and author of the book, What Your ADHD Child Wishes You Knew, and she shares about understanding the needs of ADHDers. I know a lot of people have an awareness of ADHD, but maybe if you can just give us a bit of insight into some of the different characteristics we might see in ADHD kids, just so we all kind of are on the same page with that as we start off. So we know that ADHD is a biologically based condition. It's largely hereditary, but not exclusively. Around 55% of kids with ADHD have at least one parent who has ADHD, even if they are not necessarily aware of it. <laughs> you know, signs of ADHD would be impulsivity, hyperactivity. It could also be inattentiveness, uh, kind of dreamy, a quality, a lack of focus. Uh, we can also see, particularly in girls, um, social issues, and we see these in boys, too, difficulty making and maintaining friendships, impulse control, uh, challenges, emotional dysregulation, as well as issues with memory and follow through and being able to kind of stick with something, even if it's unpleasant. Because one of the things that happens for all people with ADHD is that they have lower amounts of dopamine and norepinephrine in their brains. And those are two pretty important uh, neurotransmitters. Dopamine has to do with pleasure and reward and interest and satisfaction. And norepinephrine has to do with you know, concentration and sleep. And so we'll see, particularly in the dopamine pathways in the brain, that there's either less activity or there's there's just a kind of unusual activity. You know, it depends on everyone's brain is a little bit different. And so this is why people take medication. They may choose to or not, but they often take medication to assist with uh, the neurotransmitters who are like the fairies of, of, of the brain. They basically take a message from one neuron to another across the synapse, which is like a river. So it's like a ferry crossing. And um, in people with ADHD, sometimes those ferries just, there's not enough of them. Sometimes they run too slowly. Sometimes they run too quickly. They pick up the message and they take and they deliver it when it actually needs to hang out in the river a little bit. And so everybody's brain is different. I think that's one of the things that is hard to overcome. And that is the the stigma about ADHD because it looks like, from an external point of view, a lack of effort or a lack of caring. And if you just tried harder, you know, then things would be okay. And that's the message that a lot of ADHDers get quite a bit, which is inaccurate. It's completely inaccurate because the dopamine pathways have a lot of connections to the prefrontal cortex. So if you're listening, you take your hand and you put it on your forehead and you say, what were you thinking? Or, oh my goodness, or in my culture, oy vey. Um, that's the part of the brain behind your hand, behind your forehead, that is the prefrontal cortex. And it's um, responsible for executing tasks. So that's where the executive functioning skills, really, that term comes from. And uh, there's a lot of connection through the dopamine and the norepinephrine pathways to the prefrontal cortex. And there's also sometimes some structural differences in people's brains with ADHD. So when adults um, and sadly, parents um, think of their kids as just not trying hard enough. Like you can play, you can play your video game for you know two hours and be fine and concentrate. But you know, when I ask you to rake the yard, you can only do it for five minutes. And I would say, well, of course, that's because the the games are a high dopamine activity. There's a lot of reward and satisfaction and stimulation. And raking the yard is a low dopamine 
frankly, (laughs) boring activity where I can't even see the results. And if I do make a big pile of leaves, I want to jump into that. (laughs) <laughs> which will undo my work. So, uh, you know, today I was talking with someone who I, with, with, um, I do some supervision and, you know, she was telling me about this boy who's in high school and his parents are so down on him, you know, and he's not done well. He's very bright, but he's low grades and he's, you know, becoming a senior and, you know, he doesn't really trust adults and he, she's trying hard to make a connection, um, but it's, it's very challenging um, partially because the message he gets is like something's wrong with you because you can't take out the trash mm-hmm. and remember to do that. I was working with, um, during COVID, uh, a college student who was living at home, and um, her parents really wanted her to do a better job with the dishes. And she's quite bright, so she fits in the TUI category, you know, which is right in your ballpark, Emily, and also in mine. And um, and. And she's like, why can't you just do the dishes? Why can't you just do the dishes? And she said to me, I hate doing the dishes. Like, I'll do any other chore. I'll do the litter box. I'll do the composting. I'll take the trash out. I just, I don't really see the dishes and I hate doing them. So we talked about how to have a conversation with your parents and say, could we make a trade? (laughs) You know, I'll do this thing that actually means something to me and and I'll put my dishes in the sink, but um, or I'll work with you after dinner, but I can't really do it myself. I'm just not good at it. And her parents, who are really enlightened, and one of them is a therapist, were like, okay, we'll try and see how this works. And they did, and it worked better because she actually did the things that she said she would. Yeah. That's kind of what I talk about a lot in my book and in my card deck and on my website, which is meeting kids where they are instead of where you want them to be or you think they should be. This is a topic that you think a lot about and talk a lot about is ADHD and anxiety, Mm -hmm. because I think so often those two things go hand in hand, even if we aren't necessarily talking about clinical anxiety. What are your thoughts about the connection between those two pieces? It's a great question. Thank you. According to the statistics in the research, about 34% of kids with ADHD have co-occurring anxiety. That is clinically diagnosed. Personally, in my practice and probably in yours and for everybody who's listening, you see this more often. A child or a teen or an adult may not meet the the criteria to have a, a, a diagnosis, but they may still live with a lot of anxiety. And actually, the statistics for adults with anxiety with ADHD are even higher, closer to 50%. Yeah. That's something that is, is, it's important for us to really take a few minutes, just as you've suggested, and explore that. One of the things that I think happens um, with ADHD and anxiety is that people with ADHD are a little more hypervigilant about themselves and about things in the world. And some of that comes from that negative feedback that uh, that kids get early on about missing the mark when they're not even sure what they did, about saying something inappropriate when they didn't know it was it was not the strong choice, um, about maybe tripping or having um, a speech impediment or stuttering or whatever it is. And so, what happens is over time, the kids start to develop. Um, a nervousness about themselves, which can then develop into anxiety. Like, when is the next time that I'm going to mess up that I didn't even know I was doing? Or when is the next time that something bad is going to happen? Because it always does. And so this then develops, you know, general anxiety. And then over time, what we see is 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 a transition sometimes into panic um, into social anxiety, uh, and of course, the, the, the everyday concerns about, you know, am I safe? Am I going to feel okay? Uh, is it secure? And so um, these, are, these are things that we see. We also see perfectionism, which is a sort of a manifestation of anxiety, and of course, procrastination, which is also a manifestation of anxiety, because if you follow it along the line, it's like, oh, you know, am I going to be able to do this? I haven't done this in the past. What makes me think I'm going to do it this time? Forget it. I think one of the things that's interesting, too, is that once those patterns are there, even if you're working on the ADHD and the executive function skills, and even if you try medication and the medication is really effective, I think it's really hard to then unlearn 
those patterns of anxiety. The executive function stuff maybe is almost a little bit easier to quote unquote fix. I don't think that's really the right word, but you know what I mean. Mm -hmm. But once those beliefs are there, once those worries are there, once that hypervigilance is there, it's just hard to escape that. It is. And, you know, there is a, a, a genetic sort of susceptibility to anxiety. You know, a- anxious parents have anxious kids um, and anxious kids may have anxious parents. There, It's not so much a predisposition as it is um, with, with depression, but it is a, a kind of proclivity that we see that anxiety often runs in families. And of course, because many people with ADHD struggle with emotional regulation. So what happens is you have a little uncertainty. And because it's difficult for you to manage the intensity of your emotions when you have ADHD, that little bit of uncertainty or insecurity can feel like a tidal wave in certain situations, and then you're just struggling to keep your head above water. And so what happens is that a lot of times adults and well-intentioned parents try to reassure their kids. Um, And really what kids need is validation rather than reassurance, because you as their parent, you can't be there all the time to let them know it's going to work out. And frankly, you don't know that it's going to work out. What we want to do instead is to validate, yes, you know what? It makes sense that you're afraid on the first day of school. Lots of kids are. You're not sure who your teacher is or what it's going to be like to be in this class. I get it. Instead of don't worry, you'll be fine. It always works out. So it's a tough, it's a tough dance for us because yes, we want to love them up and help them believe in themselves. And the way that we want to do that is to actually be the memory bank of past successes times when they overcame anxiety that we could bring into this situation so that they understand that that they have the capacity in them to get through this, even though it is a little scary. The next conversation is with Sarah Snyder. She's the host of the podcast Adulting with ADHD, and our conversation centered around coming to terms with a diagnosis of ADHD when you finally get a diagnosis as an adult. One of the things that prevents adults from going and seeking an assessment is they think it's only related to kids. And one of the other factors that goes along with that is the stigma of an ADHD diagnosis. Mm -hmm. And also, you mentioned how your daughter is kind of adjusting herself. I I think a lot of times maybe adults don't realize if they already have that diagnosis of ADHD, maybe as they get through adulthood, they might think they've outgrown it. But probably it's because maybe they found a career that's really a good fit for them or they're no longer put in these situations where they're forced to sustain their attention or or have those different types of executive functioning skills and they're able to play more to their strengths. So I feel like that might influence it a little bit, too. A hundred percent for me, especially because my first career was as a journalist and I was a reporter. I was chasing ambulances. It was a huge adrenaline rush. And so it was so compatible with the way I was that I I felt like a fish in water. And so it never occurred to me that there could be any sort of differences in the way my brain was wired. And then the other thing is you develop all these coping mechanisms on the way um, as a matter of survival. And to you, they're not ADHD interventions. To you, you're just trying to get through your day. Um, and so, yeah, you could get used to it over decades of that kind of work and, and and feel like you outgrew it. I think another one of the confusing things, at least for parents, is when they realize it's not just about being able to focus at all. It's about being able to focus on non-preferred activities yes. because parents will go, well, my my kid can't be ADHD. They you know, can play Legos for hours or video games, or they can read for out, you know, whatever their passion might be. It's like, yes, but can they? <laughs> can they sit at the table <laughs> and finish a meal? <laughs> yes, yes, exactly. All of those little things. And if you, um, do you have to serve the exact food they're in the mood for with a variety of options, or will they eat most food that you give them? Um, and, and and it could be confusing because you could say, well, all kids are picky eaters or that's just most kids. But it's true because I notice it in myself. Like if I'm not excited about what I'm going to eat, I don't want to bother. Like if I'm going to put all the effort in and all the work into locating my meal, it's so hard to feed yourself with ADHD. 
then I better like it. I better enjoy it, you know? And she's the same way, which I love. We get to have our, we have little samplers that we make that are just a little of everything and um, it works out very fine, but you have to know that. And if you don't know that, you're thinking my child's being oppositional or maybe she has um, gastrointestinal issues. And it's like, no, she just needs to be I'm excited about what she's eating. I feel like there are a lot of those little things that influence how the ADHD diagnosis impacts them, maybe in ways that they wouldn't understand or expect. Can you think of some other examples of that other than like, for example, the food, either for kids or adults that that maybe people wouldn't realize otherwise? Well, um, the the passion. Um, my daughter, for example, very passionate about um, dancing and playing tag. And it, it goes back to what you're saying. When they're interested, they're super into it. You know, I've had the same reaction. Like, how could your kid have ADHD? Look at her. She's running around with all the kids and she's fine. I said, yeah, she's in movement. She's moving. And I think a lot of parents miss that. And I think what you see isn't always what you get. You're not seeing them after school. You're not seeing the routines and all the work it takes to to make that happen. And I think that's often misconceived um, situation where you, you know, oh, I have my diagnosis. I got my medicine. Okay, we're fine. You know, and it's just, it's not this straight linear path. It's very wiggly with ups and downs and complicated. Do you find that you end up following your passions as well? Yeah. And that's a whole other thing in itself because you get passionate. And then you're too passionate, but then you have these other things <laughs> like this, you know, like what, what we're doing right now, you know, that that's my, that's where I play. That's my passion. But then it's like, oh, but you have um, your day job and, and you're passionate about that too. It's so confusing to be passionate about so many things and you only have 24 hours in a day. And so um, for me as an adult, having that freedom and not having structure, it really forces you to get real. Why are you doing this? Um, how much can you give to this compared to your other things? You still want to be a good parent. You still want to participate in your family systems and feed yourself and all these other things you have to do. So how do we make all that work together? And I feel like most of my effort is into that right now. It's it's a huge challenge getting all that. Um, it's not even balanced. It's just like blended and, um, you know, having an equilibrium. Probably some of the best advice that an adult with ADHD could get is is to find ways to lean into that passion to me, that's a very strengths-based approach, and we talk about it a lot when we're talking about kids, but I think adults feel like they have to do certain things or pursue certain tasks, and I, I feel for adult ADHDers, if they try to fit into a certain box that they feel will make them, quote-unquote, successful or, I don't know, whatever it might be, Adult. Yeah. Adult. En yes. Enough. Yeah. Yeah. Totally. And and that yeah. just ends up, not to be over dramatic, but kind of breaking their spirit. You grow resentful. You grow, you, you get this pit in your stomach when you're, when you're working on something you're not really excited about. And, and we all have things we have to do. And that's not what this is. This is like, you're forcing your, you're shoehorning yourself into a job, for example. Um, there's a difference between that and deciding this isn't for me. I'm going to look for something else while keeping what I have. It's a whole dance that you have to learn. And, <laughs> and I remember, I remember being told, cause I, I would change jobs quite a bit every two to three years, which is now the norm. But I remember getting a lot of criticism for that. And now I have the hindsight of knowing I was taking care of myself in a way I wasn't aware of at the time. I was moving on to things that were better fits for me. I actually had a friend at one point in time who, <laughs> I don't know that he'll ever hear this. <laughs> I don't care. I'll call him. I'm going to call him out. But he had been he had been a police officer. And then his next career was he was a chef mm -hmm. and a cook. And then the next thing we knew, he was going back to school to do nursing. Mm -hmm. And it was all of these different things. But the problem with that was they were so separate from each other. He was starting over every single time. Yeah. When I would talk to him and we would talk about the parallels, I would say, yeah, I was a teacher, but then I, I moved to a different type of teaching, but then I was a counselor. And then now I've, you know, do the podcast and the books and the speaking. So I kind of stayed in the same lane, mm -hmm. which has been helpful for me professionally. And so I think finding ways to to just tweak it a little bit. You know, find something that you're really interested in, but then then lean into wherever those interests are pulling you can be 
can be useful. Yeah. Or um, a word I like, it's a concept I like. The word is entrepreneurship, I think. It's creating the situation you want where you're at, which I think gets overlooked a lot. And I overlooked it. I, you know, always had this idea of I'm not getting what I need. I just need to leave. But you might, I mean, you may or may not be in a situation where you can kind of negotiate what you want Mm. where you're at. And of of course, not everybody is that fortunate, but I've seen people do that. And um, it's a strategy that's not often talked about with, with ADHD. It's always the focus of, oh, they're job hopping. Oh, they, they failed at this. So now they're going to do this. And it's always the eye roll of, oh, look, now she's going to be doing this. And you know, what is she up to now? But like you said, it should be more strength based. Like, oh, but look at that passion. Look how she can just pick up anything and run with it. That is so cool. We'll wrap up this Perspectives episode with Dr. Stephen Hinshaw, who is the author of the book Straight Talk About ADHD in Girls and a professor of psychology at UC Berkeley. However, in this clip, we aren't specifically talking about ADHD in girls, we're actually talking about radical acceptance for ADHDers. You used the phrase radical acceptance a moment ago. Yeah. How do you connect that with ADHD? So radical acceptance and radical commitment are terms actually borrowed from dialectical behavior therapy, the very intense therapy for mid-teens, older teens, young adults who often have strong self-injurious tendencies or substance abuse tendencies. And often such kids from an early age have been very sensitive to environments, often quite impulsive too. So radical acceptance in DBT means, you know, I'm not like most people. I'm more sensitive to criticism and I'm more intense. I can't really fundamentally change that. But if I wallow in how different I am, maybe I have to accept that. But at the same time, I'm radically committed to meditating and skills and learning to cope with difficult emotions. So in the first chapter, on the second page of Straight Talk about ADHD and girls, my message to parents is radically accept your daughter and her differences after a thorough assessment, but radically commit to getting the best evidence-based treatment you can and radically commit to finding and promoting her strengths. Yeah, I I think that that's really important. And I think also, like you mentioned, not diminishing or minimizing the struggles that come along with it. That's right. I think that's one of the pieces that's really difficult. Or for parents, when it is that inconsistency, when you do see this, it's like, oh, well, you can do it here. You can do it. That's very confusing. Are you trying to drive me crazy? Yeah. (laughs) Why can't you do this homework now? Just sit down and do it. And we talk about motivation in ADHD. Mm. One of the hallmarks of ADHD is a slower curve or trajectory of developing intrinsic motivation for tasks that initially are hard to learn. Now, when you say low motivation, people say, oh, that means you think kids with ADHD aren't trying. They're trying, but some of the genes that underlie ADHD and some of the neural pathways are under sufficient with dopamine and how it's transmitted. So if that's the case, it's going to take longer and with more extrinsic rewards or sometimes with a stimulant medication to help build the circuits and build the skills so that you get the experience with success where you need those rewards, extrinsic rewards, less and less of the time. So motivation is a big part of it, but it's a big mistake to say you're just lazy, you're not trying hard. Despite efforts, it's going to take some structured teaching to help kids and teens and adults with ADHD do good work. CBT, cognitive behavior therapy, for teens and adults with ADHD, focuses on organizational skills, time management, anger control. These are skills you can learn if you go on to post-secondary education, in a job, in a relationship, because people with ADHD often crave the immediate and often don't transition well from activity to activity. Yeah, There's an example in a wonderfully written part at the end of chapter three in Straight Talk by uh, Dr. Sarah Chung, who was a grad student at Berkeley that I knew quite well, who got diagnosed with ADHD at the age of 31 in the middle of a doctoral program. All the signs had been there. 
but from her Asian background and family low acceptance of kind of divergence from the norm and her own ultimately flailing compensatory strategies, she toughed it out in high school and college and early grad school, and her life changed with the diagnosis because she could get the treatment she needed and could forgive herself. Because along, like with so many girls and women with ADHD, along with this untreated history was a lot of self-blame and a lot of serious depression. Yeah. I think another factor that's really influential right now, at least that I'm noticing in, in my practice, is just layering of the impact of the pandemic and the trauma that everything <laughs> that has gone on there. Yeah. There's also, I think, this component with the ADHD piece where perhaps families, when everybody was home, they started noticing different symptoms that maybe they weren't seeing before. I'm just curious, can you talk a little bit just about teasing out the <laughs> different diagnoses and where we are now because of everything that's happened over the last two years? So when the pandemic began, March 2020, with lockdowns in most places, within months, in kids and teens and adults, anxiety and depression went up. Within a year, most adults had returned to baseline. Pre previous coping strategies, a beginning of hybrid work, etc. Kids and teens never returned to baseline. In the first year of the pandemic as well, paradoxically, rates of ADHD diagnoses went down. What? Well, the teacher saw the kid in a Zoom box. The kids weren't disrupting. And so teachers who were often a linchpin of providing the feedback to families and and clinicians about behaviors in school, they, they weren't making those referrals. Does that mean ADHD didn't exist? No. In fact, these are the kids who would click off their Zoom boxes earlier or be hiding under the desk or not learning. We know it's been a national tragedy of the lowered achievement. What we haven't done is broken that down by diagnostic groups like ADHD. I believe that the pandemic has created an educational and mental health crisis for young people. And for people with ADHD, in some ways it's forged some self-reliance, but in other ways, it's taken away some of the social connections and the bonds with teachers and other kids that can help promote strengths. So here in the fall of 2022, where we're out of the pandemic, or are we, <laughs> but most schools are back in person, but without some of the supports back in place, I think it's gonna be a rough time for people with ADHD uh, for, for, for a while to come now. Radical acceptance of all types of neurodiversity is vital, not just for parents or teachers to accept those they support, but also for those of us who are neurodivergent to accept ourselves. If you would like to hear the full episodes from any of the experts you heard here, check out the link in the show notes. I'm Emily Kircher Morris. I'll see you next time on the Neurodiversity Podcast. This is a service of the Neurodiversity Alliance.